This is Larry Hedrick for Mysteries of Superstition Mountains, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today we have another great story by Jack San Felice. This is a really fascinating story. It's got some real strange twists to it. I, the real true story, and it's called Murder at the San Mateo. The name of this ranch it was found in the 1800s in the superstitions. It's, it's gone for years by the name of San Mateo, but the actual name of the ranch was the Castro Ranch. Castro Ruiz, F-R-U-I-Z. And they were partners in a ranch off Peralta Road, but it's, and actually the way it, you have to go in is El Camino Viejo, where it's now a development out there. There's a dirt road that goes back through and takes you, oh, it's a horrible road now, a horrible, horrible road. But this story is about Trapper Wellborn. His name was Howard Trapper Wellborn. He had lived there at the San Mateo, and right next to where he was living was a very famous spring called the San Mateo Spring. And the spring had an actual claim on it. It was a water right that the Castro's and Reese family had for maybe since the turn of the century. In fact, they also had a mining claim there because um, Antonio Castro, in, in, as, as a cowhand, or rather as a rancher, he also was a prospector. Thought he would always find some mineral that was worth something. So he filed a mining claim, a load claim. A load claim means you can dig underneath the ground, go down and mine shafts. And so he must have had found something that, gave him some indication that maybe he should file a claim. Or he filed the claim in order to keep the property, to keep that property. So that claim is, and has been in a family, well, since the 1800s, and here we are, 2020. And as of a few years ago, I was going back uh, to where the Castro Reese family would have their, their uh, family reunion at the San Mateo. And there were several, when I first went out there, there were several buildings. Now, this was about 2000 when I was back in there. I'd heard the story of San Mateo and I wanted to get back in there and, and get the story of what happened because I knew the story of Trapper Wellborn and he was murdered and is murdered by a barber. We go back into the, uh, archives and I find this newspaper articles on how Howard Trapper was his nickname, Wellborn. He was 78 years old and in 1991 he was murdered by his partner. They had a partner in a mining claim at the San Mateo ranch in the Superstition Mountains in the southern foothills. The barber had been a barber for 29 years, had four children. I won't leave his name, I won't discuss his name, but I will discuss Trapper. Well, they had fallen out, and the falling out was over the mining claim. Either that Trapper didn't want to mine it, didn't believe it, or the barber thought maybe Trapper had found some gold and was hiding it from him. Trapper's son, named Hal, Hal Wellborn, he hadn't seen his father in 30 years because he, when he was a child, the mother divorced the father and took the children and moved to another state. And in an interview earlier on, uh, uh, during the times that people come in to talk to, to Trapper Wellborn, that they asked, did you have a family? He said, at once I did, but they, a long time ago, but they moved out of state and I could never find him, and I moved to Arizona. So Hal comes to, to meet his father that morning, and he hadn't heard from him for a couple days, and he had just met up with them two or three weeks before, after 30 years, after 30 years of not being his father, and they were reconnecting. It's just one of the sad parts of this story. He don't hear from him, so he goes to the, the building where he's making his residence on the San Mateo, which is just a 
stone's throw from where the, uh, the San Mateo Spring was, and it had a knob on it, you get water. It had uh, like a faucet, and uh, also there was cisterns uh, built there in the early uh, 1900s that would hold water for the dry periods. And it came right out of a spring in the hills. There, in fact, there were, they had filed claims on three springs there. Hal comes in, he finds his father dead, laid down. He thought he died of a heart attack. No, then he sees the blood. Then he sees the bullet holes. And then he, he, he sees the dog, his dog Blue. Trapper had an a Australian blue healer, and he called him Blue. And whoever did the murder had killed the dog Blue also in this old cabin at the San Mateo Ranch in 1991. So Hal calls the Sheriff's Department and they do an investigation and talking to the old ranchers out there and the people in Apache Junction, he found out that he had a partner named uh, so-and-so and he was the barber. That was a, <laughs> that was almost shut and dry right from the, right the get-go. Being a policeman 30 years, I'm saying, my God, you got all this evidence already. And, the, and so they start talking to the guy and they find out he was weird and that he had gone off the deep end. So they take it, they, they, they charge him with first degree murder. But the court appoints a, a psychiatrist and his family gets a psychiatrist. They find out that he's, he'd gone off the deep end. He's really insane now. So he, he's judged by the courts to be criminally insane as he put in an insane asylum for the criminally insane, which means you gotta, you probably stay there the rest of your life. So I don't know that he ever got out. I, I followed up on the story. I never fought, saw any subsequent stories where the barber ever got back out of jail or out of the insane asylum. That happens. They will release murderers, but they gotta be there a long time. So if he's already been a barber for 29 years, Trapper's 78, I figured the barber's gotta be around 65. So he'd have to probably say in 15 or 20 years, probably, probably passed away there. So I'm going to go back out and find out what's going on with the ranch. And, and now I'm doing the history of it, working on now a story for my cowboy book. And I'm trying to get my cowboy book, all of the stories of the early cowboys. What better, what better to find out is to meet the Castros and meet the Reese's. Well, I did. I got to meet them at a family reunion. I got their stories. My cowboy book has got all these photos of them. I have photos of the ranch. The BLM, or state trust land, one or two, it like splits it up. And they made them tear down the build, all the buildings out there except for one. So there was only one building left the last time I was out there. The spring still had water. And, it, and when I first went there, the water was fantastic. They said that a holy woman had got there, went out there and blessed the water and that it could have certain cures. Well, I don't know about that. That's a story I didn't follow up on. I did meet a person that had uh, uh, the property rights. Her name was Andrade, A-N-D-R-A-D-E. And she was related to the Castros or Reese's. And they, there were just tons of cowboys out there. All this was open range in the 1800s. No fences. And they had great big roundups. So I had to learn about the ranch, the cowboy, the history of the cowboys. They buried Trapper in, a, in Superior Cemetery. And at the, in the Superior Cemetery, he's buried no trees. It's, it is super hot. And I think he might even have a cement covering over his grave. He's got a headstone. Now, Blue, the dog, was buried. Now, in 19, uh, 2000, rather, when I first found it, Blue had buried in a grave right next to the old ironwood tree where he used to lay in the shade. And it wasn't too far, maybe 100 feet or so, from where uh, Trapper was. During the day, when Trapper would be out on his things, he'd go with them. He was a great dog for Trapper. And the people I talked to when, from the family, the Castros and the Reese family, they, they knew Trapper. They loved Trapper. He was, their, he was their caretaker. 
I go to visit Blue's grave, and the Indian um, grind holes are out there at all the springs. When I was out there, they only talked about three springs. But when I started searching, there were six springs. Uh, one of the Castro boys told me, oh, yeah, you can find those Indian grind holes everywhere. I said, for the water. I said, well, great. I said, well, I'm going to start doing a little searching. And I got Jack Carlson. I said, Jack, you and I are going to try to find the mystery of where this mine, where was their claim? And let's find out about the ranch. They had a dispute. The talk was that they had a dispute over the mining claim. And one or the other thought there was gold, and the other thought there was nothing. And that's the way it usually goes. You get disgusted if you don't find something. Well, Jack Carlson and I climbed those hills, climbed that area. We found a copy of the mining claim. Did, were we at the right place? We don't know. So I find the Castros, and I get them to show me where the mining claim was. He comes out there with us. He lives in Florence, and I had met him before. And so we go out there where it was, okay, and then he left. He followed us. Jack Carlson and I spent a whole day in that area of mine. Now, mining claim is, it's a long ways. It's 20 acres. So we tromped around that 20 acres one day, came back a few days later, did it again. A few days later, we come back and looked again. If a man kills a man over a mining claim, there's got to be something. It's got to be either azurite, chrysocol, or malachite, or white quartz, or evidence that there's red dirt, something that would give us a clue what was there. Red dirt, you can sometimes find, uh, is sometimes associated with iron, iron ore, and sometimes there's gold associated with iron ore. Also, there's mercury associated with red dirt, red and gray dirt. Uh, we couldn't find any of that. We saw some similar to red, and now there were some signs up on a hill. Someone had painted them there on this one hill on the mining claim. It was old, 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 but they had painted. We couldn't make out what they were. I had no clue they were up on a bench, like. And some, I guess it maybe was part of the family had put something, maybe it was a picnic area for them at one time. They told me that where the old original cabin was, they had had a log cabin there, stone and then logs, okay? They pointed out where that was, pointed out the mine site, pointed out where the springs were, pointed out where the grind holes were. So where this, this mystery is kind of coming to a head here. There's no gold. But the one time I'm saying we go back and we drove up to the ironwood tree and some nitwit, I'll call them nitwit or idiot, had shot up Blue's headstone made out of a big rock. Busted it all to hell and back. So I called the um, family, the, the Castro boy that I knew, boy, he's 40 years old, right? <laughs> okay, I called him, I said, you know someone had, that's really terrible, he said, yeah. We, were take, we always took care of his grave. And so uh, Jack Carlson and I was there, and we, our photo, I think, I have a photo of the headstone blue, died November 3rd, 1991, and that's about the same time all those cr crazy people were out at the Ward's cabin, and they were living in Ward's cabin, and Ward was still, he died about 1991. A guy named um, 45 Bob that liked to shoot his gun a lot, and some of those others that liked to shoot their big guns. They, why would it, unless they got drunk and shot it up. I said, there's nothing. So anyhow, the next time Jack Carlson and I go out there, we take Bob Stongbach, a friend of mine who's a photographer, so he can get some shots. He went, he went with me quite a bit in the early days of the hiking. And Bob was younger than me, so that's good too. And uh, uh, so the three of us are out there. We go out there, and lo and behold, somebody, somebody has replaced the broken stone with a a metal headstone, and it's three, four inch plate steel. And it's, it, it's marked, blue, here lies blue, November 3rd, 1991. And 
it, we can't move it. It's it buried in there with cement, concrete. You can see pieces of concrete that have been laid around there. There were two bullet holes in it, two bullets. They didn't go through it. They were in it. But whoever put it in there made it so that the ricochet would ricochet back. So I only saw two. I kind of think maybe they were going to shoot a third and I thought about it, and maybe the ricochet got them or almost got them. But I, after that, I never saw any more holes in that plate steel. So what's the mystery here? We, it was cut and dry about blue, was killed by the barber. He killed Trapper. The mystery of this story lies, why did the barber kill Trapper over nothing, over a claim? But then again, he was judged insane. Was there ever any gold out there? No one has ever, to the best of my experience, found gold. We never found any evidence of silver or copper. Where was the, and where was the dig hole? Where was the prospect? We never found a prospect hole. So the mystery of the San Mateo lies in why? Why was Trapper, a good old guy, murdered? Why was he murdered for something that wasn't even there? That no gold was ever, to the best of my knowledge, or precious metal was found there. But, but maybe, just maybe, in the barber's mind, he went off the deep end after all the years of searching for gold, couldn't find it, and Trapper wanted to give up the claim, and maybe he didn't want to give it up. That's the only reasonable thing I can understand. So that's part of the mystery of the Superstition Mountain and the murder on the San Mateo. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.